I want to talk about something because of a couple of questions that came up during the break, and this is kind of by way of general spiritual housekeeping. Uh, and this may or may not apply to, to you, but it will probably apply to someone you know. So, um, let me start by saying that many people don't understand the dynamics of getting out of a false religious organization, like the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, you know, whatever. Uh, and you can decide, I mean, for yourself, what you think a false religious organization is. I mean, personally, I'd do this if I was a former Catholic, too. Now, some people think, well, Catholics are okay. Well, you know, as someone who's sort of a, I was 35 years in the Catholic Church. I used to be a Catholic priest in the old Catholic rite. Uh, I have a degree from a Catholic seminary, and frankly, I didn't know the Lord from a doorknob when I was a Catholic. So, you know, whatever, you know, my point is, there's things that people may not understand about getting away from these kind of organizations. Um, early on, when I was working with Ed Decker, who's the head of Saints Alive, you may have heard of his film and book, The Godmakers, which came out in the early 80s and more or less turned the, the Mormon church on its ear because it told the truth about Mormonism in a way that that the average person could understand it. There had been other research out there, but he just really blew the doors off. And from him I learned that when you're in a group like that, you've, you've basically entered into a contractual relationship, whether it's the Kingdom Hall of the Jehovah Witnesses, whether it's the LDS Church, or, or whatever. Or even if you're in a witch coven. Or even if you're in a spiritualist church. Or if you're in the Masons. Okay? So, here's the problem. You can get born again, and I pray everybody here is saved by the cross and the blood of Yeshua. But, you know, that is the, the most important thing. But the problem is, and I use this metaphor in my book, Blood on the Doorpost, I say it's like in, in John 11, when Yeshua raised Lazarus from the dead. You know, he comes up to the tomb, and I mean, you know, we all have read the passage, you know, he says, Lazarus, come forth! And this guy shuffles forth out of the tomb, and everybody freaks, you know, because he was dead for like, what, five days? But, then what does he say? He turns to his disciples and he says, now loose him and let him go. And what did he mean? Well, that was the grave clothes. Because it was the custom in Israel that, that it kind of be wrapped up a little bit like a mummy when you, were, when you passed away. And um, so, in the same way, when you get born again, especially if you're born again out of a cult, like, I mean, I came out of like five or six cults, uh, you know, somebody needs to come some believer, and loose you and let you go. And part of that process is you need to send a letter to that organization, whether it's, you know, the Mormons, the Moonies, the Masons, the JWs, whatever, and formally ask that your name be taken off the rolls of that organization, whatever it is. That, that does something on the legal plane. Because, see, Satan is a legalist. And if you, if you have not done that, then he has every right. It won't affect your salvation. I'm not saying, oh, if you don't write that letter, you're going to hell. But what I am saying is, in your Christian life, you're going to be shuffling. Kind of like someone who's bound up in, in the ceremonies of grave clothing. Like Lazarus was. And that's critically important. Now, also, you need to renounce spiritually that organization. And we have prayers for doing this in the back of Blood on the Doorpost, which is our spiritual warfare manual, so to speak. It's out there on the table. That was a shameless plug, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, and we have the strong men listed. So, for example, if you're a former Freemason, 
Or if you have that in your family, like maybe your dad was a Freemason, your grandfather was a Freemason. Because this stuff percolates down to the family lines, okay? You know, the sins of the fathers are visited unto the children, even to the third and fourth generation. But remember the other side of that verse, which is the good news. This is right out of the Ten Commandments, folks. This is right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. People say, oh, I don't believe I can get sins from my father. Well, it's right in the Ten Commandments. But the next verse, Yahuwah says, But my mercy is unto a thousand generations of them that love me. So, you know, we want to emphasize both of those. But you need to deal with that. Because otherwise, it's going to affect you, it's going to affect your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Because the devil, as I said, is a legalist. And if he can find any kind of way to get in there, he knows he can't steal your soul. Okay? Your soul is in the hands of Yeshua. And he says, no man can take these out of my hand, these, those that the Father has given me. But he can make your life miserable. You might be on your way to heaven, but your life might be a hell. And I've been there. I've been there. I was born again. In 1984, like I said in the first part of this, and yet uh, because I was in a denomination where they believed if you were born again, you couldn't have a demon. That's a very common teaching in the body. But it's not true. People say, well, if I have the Holy Spirit in me, how can I have a demon? Well, where is God? <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere. If the, if the Holy Spirit is everywhere. So if the Holy Spirit is everywhere, then demons can be nowhere. And obviously there are demons. Well, of course, some preachers nowadays would deny that. But if you read the Bible, it's obvious there are demons. Amen? Amen. Both Testaments, demons. In fact, what's really funny is there are a whole lot more demons in the New Testament. Did you ever notice that? There's barely any demons in the Old Testament. And most of the demons, now here's something that will bake your noodle spiritually. Most of the demons in the Old Testament are sent by Yahuwah. You ever notice that? Yes. Think about it. But we see what happened was, is there was an encounter on the cosmic level. When Yeshua came down and set foot on the earth, he kind of like stomped on the anthill of hell. Because compared to him, that's what hell is, it's an anthill. That's all it is. A little anthill. And all of a sudden, all the demons started buzzing around, you know, especially where he was. Because, and, and I know this from experience, although I'm not even worthy to walk in the shadow of the Messiah. But when I walk into a place, sometimes I stir up the demon, you know, just by being there. And, and it's just the nature of things. It's a cosmic encounter between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> anyway, hallelujah. Oh, it's fun getting old. Anyway, uh, too many funny cigarettes, like I said in the last hour. Anyway, um, the point is, is that you need to take away the devil's right to trouble you and your family. Step number one, write a letter to that organization, make it a registered letter. And even if this is 20 years ago, Let's say you left the Mormon church in 1984 like I did, but you never did this. And you're wondering, why can't I get victory in my life? Why can't I get a, a, a really powerful, anointed walk? Why can't I feel on fire? You know, I see other people in my church that are really on fire, that really get into worship, that really get into praise. What's wrong with me? Why do I feel like I'm half asleep walking through my life? shuffling, because you're still wearing your grave clothes. So, step one, write the letter. Step two, get down on your knees or with your pastor and renounce the, the whatever thing you were in, the coven, the Masonic Lodge, whatever. Step number three, and this is critical, renounce the false headship of that organization. Because when you join an organization like that, you illegally enter into a covenant with like 
the governing body of the Jehovah Witnesses, or the First Presidency of the Mormon Church, or the Pope, or whatever, and you want to break that legal tie right then and there. So pray and renounce the false headship of that organization, whatever it might be. You, you, you can do this with a pastor. You, you don't have to. You can just do this in the privacy of your own prayer closet. And that is very important. Those three things are critical. Of course, get rid of any bric-a-brac that's associated with those things. You know, like Masonic aprons or whatever, if you were a Mason, or you have uh, stuff from uh, a relative that's a Mason. Or, you know, you get the point. You know, Books of Mormon. Um, if you were a Christian scientist, science and health, key to the scriptures. Uh, Joel Witness Bibles. Um, anything like that. You need to destroy those things by fire, ideally. And if some people have said, well, that's not... You know, I, I live like in an apartment, what am I going to do? You know, well, you know, I tell people, hey, wait until there's a nice day, go to a park where they have like those little grill things where people cook hot dogs on them, get some lighter fluid, throw your Book of Mormon into the grill thing and, you know, pour some lighter fluid on it and, poof, you know, burn that sucker. And people say, you're not saying to burn a book. That's like Nazis, man. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. It's biblical. Amen? Amen? It talks about how, I think it's in Acts 19, that, you know, the um, all these people came together. There was what? There was great revival, it said, in that city. And they brought all their books of magic and of the curious arts. And they burned them. And, oh, man, you talk about that in America. You get people's ire up because we've been conditioned. Oh, that's, that's evil. That's censorship. In fact, it's funny. I... I saw this one young person when I was down, I was uh, preaching down in Australia. I was debating all of these witches in Flinders University, which is a major university in southern Australia. It was like 30 witches against me. But see, I had the Holy Spirit on my side. Amen. Plus, I also had the truth on my side, which never hurts. And this one young lady had a backpack. And you know, you see they, they have these backpacks and they have patches on them. And a patch said, read banned books. Now, that's interesting, you know. So I said, do you know what the number one banned book in the world is? And she says, no, what? I says, the King James Bible. <laughs> oh, I can read that. <laughs> that's bogus. You know? <laughs> anyway, so the point being, burn, burn things like that if you possibly can. If not... Like some people say, well, I have this thing for my father. It was this really expensive Masonic ring. It was like gold and diamonds and stuff. You can't really burn that. I says, no. But you can spoil the Egyptians. Because what Israel did is when they left Egypt, it said they spoiled the Egyptians. They took all of this gold with them out of Egypt. And what did they do? They melted it down and they made the Ark of the Covenant out of it. Because you know how much gold was in that Ark of the Covenant. Let me, let me, you know, because it says that the top of it was solid gold. The Kippur, the mercy seat that had the cherubim on it. Imagine how much that would take, how much gold that would be to be about yay big and about three inches thick. Because the Ark itself was a wooden box that was gold plated, but the lid was pure gold. Why? Because it represented the throne of Yahuwah. And, you know, hey, nothing but the best for our Lord, right? Amen. So anyway, the, the point is, is get rid of these things. And um, you, can, you can take a Masonic ring or whatever and melt it down and make it into something Christian. Like make it into a little thing that has a fish symbol on it or a little thing with the divine name on it or, or something like that. You know, whatever, whatever, you know, floats your boat. But the important thing is not to have any of these things in your possession or in your family's possession. Unless you're a minister. I mean, if you're a pastor or something like that where you might, you might need to have a Book of Mormon or something like that just to use for research. Like, I still have some of my stuff. And it's because the Lord told me to keep it, and I'm glad I did. Because when I do some talks and things, I need to refer back to these things. 
Although, of course, now you can access almost anything online. But that wasn't true until about five years ago. So anyway, that's kind of the program, you know, and you need to renounce the strongman. For example, if you were an ex-Mason, and again, all this is in blood on the doorpost, but if you're a former Mason, you need to renounce, like, you know, the strongmen of Jabalon, Tubalcane, Baphomet, Dagon, and Hiram of Beef. Because those are powerful, powerful demonic engines. They're like complexes of demonic energy that the Bible calls strongmen. And every organization has them because they've been built up over centuries of false worship. And the longer something has been around, the more powerful it is. Like a few weeks ago, I got to lead a black Muslim to the Messiah over the phone. And, you know, he even said, I want what you want. I want to be a Messianic Jew. I mean, talk about going from, you know, <laughs> one, as far as black Muslims, for the most part, are not real fond of Jews. And um, at least Louis Farrakhan sure isn't. And, uh, and so I told him, you have to renounce Allah. That's a false god. And, and just because he's been around for, you know, almost 2,000 years doesn't make him any less false. And he did, right over the phone. And I'll tell you, you could feel the warfare. But that guy got set free by the blood of Yeshua. So this is what you need to do. And, and again, there's a lot more information on this in Blood on the Doorpost. But, you know, that has nothing to do with what my talk is about. But a couple of people asked me, okay, I used to be a blah, blah. How do I make sure all that stuff is gone from me? And it might take a couple of sessions. It might, it might like, come off you in layers. Because over the years, Yahuwah has shown us things. You know, deeper levels of things. Because he wants us, and I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but he wants us to be holy. And, you know, that's a word that's not well understood nowadays. You know, well, of course I'm holy, I'm a Christian. Well, in a sense, that's true, but there's more to it than that. So, um, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, wait until tomorrow for that, or otherwise I'm never going to get through today. But anyhow, and if you have questions, you know, we're going to open up the audience to, um, to questions at the end of this. But for now, uh, I want to talk about the whole vampire thing in a little more detail, because... You know, that's partly that's what's out on the sign, but also because I, I, my heart is kind of in this. It's been laid on my heart since these movies came out, the Twilight films, and all these similar things. Um, it didn't used to be like this. I mean, I know some of you, you know, maybe all of you are so sanctified and holy you never watch movies. I don't know. But... Um, you know, if you, if you watch films over the last 20 years or so, it used to be that there'd be like this cycle. About every 5, 10 years, there'd be a spate of a few vampire movies. You know, a new version of Dracula would come out or, or some awful thing or other. And I used to be an aficionado of these movies. I mean, when I, obviously when I was a witch, I would go and I'd root like, you know, I actually rooted for the demon in, in the Exorcist movie, believe it or not. I would cheer for Pazuzu because that was the name of the demon in The Exorcist. That's how bad I was. I was really bad, you know. People say, you know, well, I'm bad. Well, I was really bad. But not bad enough that Yahuwah couldn't save me by the blood of Yeshua. So, but it's recently, and I believe it started with the book Interview, Interview with a Vampire by Anne Rice back in the early 90s. And all of a sudden, it's like this snowball rolling downhill. And she started the whole idea of vampires being more sexual, more romantic. You know, it's kind of dark. And in my book, Romancing Death, I talk about the whole idea of, of this dark, bryonic hero, which is a term out of literature. There was this poet named Lord Byron. And, and he kind of created this sort of idea of the, of the dark mysterious, slightly bad, but sexy hero. And you see it a lot in literature. I mean, even someone like, you know, in the totally secular realm, James Bond. Dark, dangerous, slightly evil, but yet still sexy. And that's what these vampire things started playing on. Was that You even saw it to a limited degree with Dracula. 
Believe it or not, Dracula is 130 years old, the novel. No, 120 years old. It was written in 1890. <clears throat> Think of that. And that's an enduring icon of, of our Western culture, for better or worse. You know, Bela Lugosi, you know, I want to drink your blood, and all of that. Uh, and yet, people have made a religion out of that, literally. When I was in this stuff, I was told that the Dracula was like a black Christ. Not racially black, but <clears throat> metaphysically black. And that's kind of a scary thing when you think about it. We're going to talk more about that later. But since the turn of the, the millennium, which I think is not inconsequential, we've seen just an avalanche of these vampire movies. You know, from the film Interview with a Vampire with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, you know, two big, huge sex symbols, I guess, in Hollywood playing vampires. And all the way up to the day, you know, and <coughs> in about two weeks, they're going to roll out the final, vamp uh, final Twilight movie. And it's going to be huge. I mean, they're already just letting ticket sales. People are just obsessed with this stuff. And we're going to kind of explore why that is. But, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of this is directed at young people. And as I kind of alluded to in the first hour, uh, for the same reason that the occult is appealing, this stuff is appealing. Because it offers a promise of power. And, and that's the deception. <clears throat> now, now, here's the difficulty. The, the seductive power of Twilight, which is a new, it's a, it's a whole new spin on the vampire thing, because these are twinkly vampires. Twinkly. Yeah, they're twinkly. See, you know how before it used to be that vampires couldn't go out in the sun because if they did, you know, they'd like melt or burst into flame or something? Well, these vampires can't go out in the sun because if they do, they'd sparkle. they twinkle. <laughs> and oh, it's, it's in the books, trust me. I, I had to read, and these are long books. I mean, like six, seven hundred page books. I had to wade through these things, and they're not, let me tell you, they're not like Burton, they're not like, you know, uh, reading Tolstoy. <clears throat> In fact, how many of you know the lady that wrote the Twilight novels is a devout Mormon? Did you know that? We're going to talk about that in a minute, too, but the, the difference is, is that now the vampire has become sanitized to the point that, that Christian churches are recommending these books. Did you know that? Because, why? Because they're pro-chastity and they're pro-life. Because the young couple, well, one of them is young, because <coughs> uh, basically, for those of you that have not read them, and I hope none of you have read them, really, but, you know, it's about a girl who's like 17 or 18 years old, depending on where it is in the, in the story, and, and she falls in love with this kid that appears to be 18 years old, but he's actually like a 102-year-old vampire who looks like he's 18. And um, they wait until marriage. How about that? A chaste vampire. <laughs> Not only that, he's a vegan vampire. <laughs> he doesn't drink human blood. <clears throat> he only runs out, in because the, they live in this little tiny town in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. They go out and they hunt down elk and bear and they drink animal blood. They never drink human blood. So that makes them good. Because, I mean, we go out and hunt animals, right? I mean... Does that make us evil? No, it doesn't. So, you know, they're just nice people that just happen to, you know, have teeth that are really long. Um, and that live forever. <clears throat> and um, then, of course, she... And, and I'll tell you what's sad about these books, is that the, the female character it is kind of... How shall I say it gently? Pathetic. I mean... She's like this kind of, I mean, somebody said that, that you know, Bella, that's the girl's name in the novels um, and in the movies, that she kind of set back feminine characters in literature like 50 years because she's like this kind of whiny, clingy, dependent, 
you know, and I, all this is documented in the book. I'm not going to belabor the point, but, you know, she's not a strong, vital woman, you know, young woman, whatever. And, you know, it's like she, she clings to her vampire boyfriend like, you know, mold on cheese. <laughs> and, and at one point she says, when in the second novel, there's four novels, in the second novel he dumps her because he's afraid that her being around him is going to be fatal for her. Right. And, um, and she just, she's like totally shattered. I mean, the whole first half of the second novel is like this one long grind of her being depressed and whiny. Because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really kind of, you know, she says, I felt like a, a moon that was adrift from her planet. You know, and, and just on and on and on, you know, just, you know, and it's like, what? I mean, aren't women their own person? Yeah, you know, I'm not saying you, if you love someone and you're married to them and you shouldn't be a part of one another, but you, you, you can't marry someone and expect to just sort of be wholly absorbed by that person like she was, you know. And here's the sad part, is by the middle of the second book, she's begging. These, this family of vampires to turn her into a vampire. Why? Because she's growing old. She's going to be 18. I mean, it's like she's got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. Because she's going to be 18. I can't even remember when I was 18. Uh, but, you know, anyway, and she doesn't want to be turning into this. She actually has this nightmare about being this old woman and Edward, who's the vampire boyfriend, is still looking like he's 18, you know. So this is what she, you know, she desperately wants to be made a vampire. And they actually discuss the metaphysics of this in the books. You know, Edward is afraid that if he makes her a vampire, she will lose her soul. And she says, I don't care. She says, if... if if heaven doesn't include you, meaning Edward, I don't want it. Now, can you imagine a church promoting books that has that kind of a message in it? No, but yet they are. Now, the other thing is, okay, they finally get married. I mean, this is a huge spoiler alert, if you care. But they get married. <laughs> they have this beautiful wedding, you know. But it's got to be in the shade because otherwise he, the groom would twinkle. <laughs> and listen, I'm not making this up. Oh, wow. oh, and there's also werewolves in it too, except they're Native American werewolves, so they're politically correct werewolves. <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> I'll admit this: this lady, Stephanie Myers, has hit all the right buttons. You know, when she wrote this, and obviously she's become an incredibly wealthy woman. But anyway. <coughs> So they get married, they go off, and by the way, like all vampires in movies, these vampires are filthy rich. For some reason, it's like, I don't know whether they have a really good investment banker or what, or they just figure, well, if we, if we live forever, we can afford long-term investments, but they're like just incredibly rich. And so they go off to a private island off the coast of Rio for their honeymoon. And anyway... Um, she gets pregnant, very rapidly pregnant, like she's already like this in like five days because she's got a, a, a child that's half vampire. And this is, this is, this is the dynamic of the, of the fourth, well actually there's five movies because they split the final book in two. The movie that's coming out in a couple of weeks is going to get into what happens post the birth of this child. And they're afraid that it's going to be a monster. And the, the parents, well, they're not really parents, but the family of Edward wants to kill the baby because they're afraid it's going to kill Bella. And she is fighting to keep the baby at all costs. And Christian churches like that because it's pro-life. And so they promote these books in spite of the fact that it's about a woman falling in love with a vampire. You know, where is the discernment? So anyway, and of course what people will tell me is they'll say, well, it's just fantasy. It's not like there are real vampires out there. It's not like there are real werewolves out there. <clears throat> yeah, 
whatever. <laughs> um, but I say this, even if that's true, even if it is fantasy, what should be the biblical response to fantasy entertainment on the part of Christians? Remember what Paul said in Philippians 4.8. He said, brethren, whatever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, this doesn't come under that heading, brothers and sisters. It doesn't. You know, this is, this is perverse. Why is it perverse? Well, as I mentioned on the radio show, and I may have mentioned briefly in the first hour, the Bible forbids the drinking of blood, animal or human, period. That's why kosher meat has been specially slaughtered and drained of all blood. If you if you see kosher meat, like you probably, I'm sure they have kosher butcher shops around the Detroit area because it's a big enough city that there's lots of Jewish people here. And they are forbidden from drinking blood. And yet here is a whole series of novels built around the idea of people that drink blood to stay alive. And, you know, the other thing I would say is this, as I mentioned on the radio, pornography is fantasy. You, you know, why not let your, your young kids, you know, your young boys especially read pornography? It, it's just fantasy. No. Because what you, you know, it's interesting. Look at the word entertainment for a moment. We use it, we just throw it out, you know, but what, what's that word mean? Like, you know, Paul talks about entertaining angels unawares. To entertain means to invite something. You know, we, and we, we entertain friends. We entertain angels. We entertain thoughts. These are things we invite into our either home or whatever, or into our minds, into our hearts. Because if you, I'm sure everybody here has read a novel. If you haven't, please talk to me. <laughs> it's a great experience if it's the right novel. And you get caught up in this stuff. If it's a well-written book, and I'll tell you, I was sitting there reading these books. I remember I was on an airplane flying somewhere to minister. And I had to read the books to, you know, um, write my book. And I found myself getting caught up in this. And I thought to myself, if I was a young girl reading these novels, I would be, I would be so totally wanting to be a vampire by the beginning of the third book. You'd have to tie me down to keep me from finding one. They're that compelling. They're that beguiling. And if that is your entertainment choice, you're filling your head and your spirit and your soul with things that are spiritually toxic. Because they're, they're violent. They're anti-God. Because there's not really, I mean, God barely exists in these novels. Just like in most films. <clears throat> so, that would be bad enough if it was a fantasy. But it's not a fantasy. There are real vampires out there. Now, are they like in the novels? Are they like in, in Dracula or an interview with a vampire? Yes and no. And I'm going to talk about that. I don't know. I certainly was not a 500-year-old vampire. <laughs> I don't know anybody that was a 500-year-old vampire. I knew a person when I was in all this creepy stuff that claimed to be a 200-year-old vampire. But how do you know? The guy could have been lying. I do know he was ice cold. He had no heartbeat, and I had to drink blood out of his chest. That's how I became a vampire. And, uh, and it's demonic. It's totally demonic. I believe now, knowing what I know now, and having read the Bible through 28, 29 times, prayerfully, I think that was a fallen angel that I dealt with. It was a fallen angelic being. And I think that's what 
a lot of this stuff can be traced back to. Now you might that might fool around your theology, and if so, okay. But you know, see what happens. Do you know how a fall, fallen angel falls? Yes. We drink the blood of a man. Yeah, exactly. Huh. A fallen angel falls because they drink human blood. I learned this partially when I was in the Satanism, but it's kind of borne out by the Bible. Because, let's look at a metaphor here. What is Adam? You know, do you remember Adam? The guy that messed up it for all the rest of us. Because uh, it wasn't Eve. It was Adam. Everybody tries to lay it on Eve. You know, let's pick on a woman, right? But no, it was Adam. Um, <clears throat> when he first sees Eve, what does he say? Besides, wow. No. <laughs> in the Bible, what does he say? He says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. What's missing? Blood. There's no blood. Adam and Eve had no blood. Just like in heaven, when we get our resurrected bodies, we'll have no blood. Why? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Yeshua taught us that. He also said, in the end of Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, he, he, came, he appears to the disciples in his resurrected form, which is somewhat like what we will have. We'll have a resurrected body someday, just like he does. And what does he say? He says, you know, touch me and feel me. You know, I have flesh and bones. I am not a spirit. He doesn't say he has blood. We're, we're accustomed to using the phrase flesh and blood. And he deliberately didn't say that. Why? Because, again, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. That's why he had to be killed in such a way that every drop of blood was drained from his body. So he could be the ultimate blood sacrifice. Because I had, I had a Jewish guy come up to me and say, he wasn't a Messianic, he did not believe in Yeshua. And he said, I got a question for you. You seem to know the Torah pretty good. You say that it's the blood of Jesus that saved us from our sins, right? And I says, yeah. And he says, why did he have to die on the cross? He was circumcised. When they circumcised him, his blood was shed as a little baby. Why didn't that save everybody? <laughs> and I told him what I just told you. Because he had to drink. First of all, he had to fulfill prophecies. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. You know. Um, and what's interesting is if you read the JPL, the Jewish Publication Society version of the Old Testament, they change that. It says something about being torn apart by lions. They got rid of him having to be pierced. So in their own way, unfortunately, the rabbis are kind of a cult too. You know, they have their false teachings and they twist the scriptures to keep people from seeing the truth about the Messiah, which is very sad, because they are the chosen people. But anyway, so, you know, so no angel has blood in their veins. And then what happens is, the devil comes along and whispers in their ear, and I think you all probably understand this, maybe you don't, that angels have a weakness for women. They like women. And they especially like long hair on women. And so the devil, you know, tantalizes them. But they know, the angels know, they cannot come down and procreate. Because they have no blood in their veins. The solution is those angels have to drink human blood. At which point they fall. Because that's a grievous sin. We've already discussed that. And they become mortal. They lose all of their angelic powers, but they don't lose their angelic wisdom. So they can no longer fly around the universe in the blinking of an eye. But they are still incredibly cunning and incredibly brilliant. And that's how they deceive us. And I would submit to you, from my understanding of these things, 
that both from the Bible and from my own experience, that most of our governments are run by fallen angels. Now, I'm not saying like Obama is a fallen angel or that, you know, the Prime Minister of Britain is a fallen angel. But I'm saying there are beings behind them that are, that look human. And I, I mean, I've seen many fallen angels in my day, both B.C. and A.D., if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, you know, they can look just like you and me. They can look male or female. They can look Asian or African or Caucasian. They can look like whatever they want because they will deceive you. And that's why we're warned that we might be, we might be entertaining angels unawares. That can be good, like Abraham was entertaining angels unawares. But it can also be terrifyingly bad. Because when you're reading the Twilight novels, or letting your children read them, you are entertaining fallen angels unawares. And that's a grave spiritual mistake. Okay, back to the thing about vampires. <clears throat> I have never seen any vampire like turn into a bunch of rats like Dracula does in the novel. I never saw them turn into mist. I never saw them turn into a bat. They don't do that kind of thing, I don't think, in real life. That's Hollywood. That's poppycock. And of course, what the devil loves to do, and how many of you realize, I hope, Hollywood is like totally sold out to the devil. Amen. I mean, they might come out once in a great, great while with a, I call them, be kind to God movie. But for the most part, you know, Hollywood is run by Satan and his minions. So anyway, um, they will glorify. They will do anything to glorify the devil. You know, and that's what they do. That's why in so many of these films, the devil seems to win. It, it's so funny, you know, like, I, because I, I, I'm a student of, of exorcism. I used to be an exorcist, but I renounced it. Because how many of you know exorcism is an occult ritual? It's not in the Bible. Did you know that? Think about it. The only exorcists in the Bible were the seven sons of Sceva. And they trotted into this demon and said, We command you, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, to get out of this guy. It didn't go very well, if you recall. <laughs> it said that the demon beat up all seven of them and they fled from the house naked and wounded. Amen? So, that's an exorcism. And I'll tell you, this, this is slightly off topic, but I'll just say this real quickly. I have seen Catholic priests die being killed by the devil trying to do an exorcism. Why? Number one, because a lot of Catholic priests aren't born again. But number two, because they're doing an occult ritual. And you can't, that's like throwing gasoline on a fire to put out the fire. You can't do it. And yet, if you look at Hollywood, almost every exorcism movie, I think I've seen one that wasn't. They're always Catholic priests versus the devil. As far back as the original exorcist film, which is, by the way, a profoundly evil film, uh, I would never recommend you watch that and certainly never let a child watch it. Uh, but, you know, it's always about the Catholic Church versus the devil. And usually, the the, the devil either wins or almost wins. You know, it, it doesn't really glorify Yeshua at all. And when we do when we do deliverance, and you know, and again, I recommend if you're at all interested in this, get blood on the doorpost. Um, but we don't have any of that weird stuff happen. Like I literally saw a priest get torn in two by a demon. Just like a wishbone. Just, <clears throat> I mean, the guy was dead before he hit the floor. Because he didn't have the real Yeshua. And the guy was a dedicated person. He really, you know, thought he was doing the work of the Lord. That's what's so sad. All of these people, Mormons, Masons, whatever, well, maybe not Masons, but Mormons, you know, they all believe they're doing the right thing. And like I said, I was serving God in the worst way. Because I missed Yeshua for all the panoply of these various cults, all of the charm, all of the glitz, all of the glamour. So, anyway, 
the point is, is that that's why the devil kind of expands on what, what, a, what a person who's actually a vampire can do. It makes them look more romantic, more glamorous. Because let me tell you, the guy that I saw that initiated me into this stuff was not attractive. He was not like a Hollywood sex god. He looked, well, he looked kind of like a human rodent. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all a bunch of history. How many of you can say praise you? Know, uh, if you want it, you know, if you're really interested in how the vampire developed through history, it's in the book, Romancing Death. But the funny thing is, it's a, I just want to say two things about it. Number one is, the earliest, one of the earliest manifestations of the vampire in history, we're talking way back, is a demon goddess named Lilitu. Now Lilitu's more modern name is Lilith. How many of you have heard of Lilith? There's a, apparently a rock festival that's called Lilith Fair. It's kind of a feminist, you know, rock festival or something like that. I guess they haven't done one in a few years, but it was huge a few years ago. Fem uh, Lilith is a feminist icon, unfortunately, because she is the first rebel figure in Jewish lore. Not in the Bible. Oh, oddly enough, love is in the Bible, but in a different context. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But um, rabbinical lore, and this is not supported by the scriptures, teaches that Adam had a wife before Eve. And her name was Lilith. And she was made, just like he was, out of the earth. Now this is folklore. This is not Bible, it's not in the Torah or anything. And supposedly she wouldn't obey Adam. And so Adam goes to the Almighty and says, I want a divorce. She won't mind me. This woman that you give me, she don't mind me. So the cherubim kick Lilith out of the garden. And the Almighty decides that to make a woman that's more tractable, more obedient, he'll pull her out of a rib and make her subservient to man. So, and by the way, most rabbis are not into feminism. Anyway, so along comes Lilith. She's kicked out of the garden, but she happens to be pregnant with child by Adam. And she's furious and she's bitter. And she's angry at both Yahuwah and at her ex-husband. And so when the baby is born, she bashes its brains out on the banks of the Euphrates River. And out of that dead baby's brains come all the demons in the universe. Now this is rabbinical folklore. And that's why Lilith has come down to us as the patron saint of abortion and infanticide. And I believe there's a direct correlation between the rise of abortion in America and the rise of vampirism in America. Because Lilith is the queen of the vampires, the, so to speak, the matriarch of all vampires in folklore. And I think she's a strong man, or a strong woman if you prefer, that goes back thousands of years. I mean, there are actually um, sculptures of her that are two to three thousand BC. That's how long she's been around. So this is a very ancient archetype that has been fed upon. And I don't, I don't have the exact. Po oh yeah, in Isaiah thirty-four fourteen, she appears. She's called in the King James Bible a screech owl, but the Hebrew word there is Lilith. Lamed, Lamed, Tuf, Lilith in the Hebrew. So, she's regarded today by vampires as like one of their two main patron saints, along with Dracula. Okay, in every culture, this is the other thing I want you to understand, and I'll leave the history behind. In every culture, down through the centuries, Asian, South Pacific, Aboriginal, Latin American, European, African, even in the Middle East, and even Native American, they all have this concept of a demon or a spirit that walks the night and drinks human blood to stay alive. It's in every culture. 
Why is that? Because I believe that as long since the fall of Adam, there have been fallen angels walking the earth that live like this. And, and it's, it's such an, in, an ingrained archetype because, again, it's sinful. It has the glamour of sin about it. And, and therefore, it's something we really need to be careful of. It's not just fantasy. It's in every possible culture. Okay. We see, as things go by, the vampire develops in literature. I'm sure you all have heard of Dracula. Uh, there's, there's other novels in the 19th century. You know, again, if you're really interested in that, you know, you can get my book. But the point is, Dracula kind of became the, the gold standard. And really, up until the turn of the millennium, almost all vampire characters kind of fit into his mold. They couldn't go out in the sunlight, they were afraid of garlic, you know, they could turn into animals, all this kind of stuff. And there was, did you know there was a real Dracula? There was a real guy. His real name was Vlad Tepes Basarab, and he was a Voivod a warlord in ancient Romania. And to this, by ancient, I mean like the 1400s. And to this day, they regard him the way we look at George Washington, as kind of the father of his country. But because he fought against the Turks, he was a very savage, savage guy. And his name, Tsepesh, means impaler, because that was his preferred method of executing his enemies. Just to, he was a real law and order guy. Just to give an example of that, Vlad reigned over this area, and just to prove how feared he was, he put a goal, his own private golden drinking chalice on a well in the middle of the town square of his capital city. No one took it. Because they knew if they took it, he'd probably kill the entire city. He was that bad. And he was known as a terror to his enemies. But these were savage times. Uh, so it's interesting that, that Bram Stoker, who's the creator of Dracula. Oh, why Dracula? What does that mean? Well, his father, whose name was Dracul, he had that title. Because he was a member of the Order of the Dragon. And you might say, well, that sounds kind of creepy. What's the deal with that? Well, in those days, the Order of the Dragon was a knightly order started by one of the popes. And the deal was, is that you got into that order by defending against the Saracens and the Turks. Because Romania is right on the eastern end of Europe, and the Turks were invading. And uh, so he got into that order... And Dracula means son of Dracul. That's all it means. It means son of the dragon in Romanian. And um, anyway, the other kind of intriguing thing about all this is that, is that for political reasons, Vlad, the son, he left the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, to become Catholic. Now, because of that, the Orthodox Church regarded him as a heretic and apostate, and they said that if, they actually told him this, if you die without repenting, the earth will barf you back up. You will never rest. It was like a curse. And this is an odd thing. I don't know if any of you are former Catholics, <laughs> but in the Catholic Church, there's this idea of being an incorruptible saint. They have saints uh, like that are entombed in various cathedrals that are they've been dead for hundreds of years, and their bodies have never decayed. And they say, "Oh, that's a sign of great sanctity. That's a sign of how special they are before heaven." What's weird about it is, is that in the Eastern Rite, the Eastern Orthodox Church, like the Greeks and the Romanians and all of that, they believe that if you're preserved like that, it's a sign that you're cursed. 
that the earth has actually vomited you up. And you will, you will never be allowed to rest in peace because you're under a curse. Strange how two branches of Christendom could have opposite views of that. So they would look at someone like a vampire and say over in the East, that person is under a curse. And that is why, you know, the whole idea came about that if you, there's certain things that make you a vampire. If you're a suicide, if you were cursed by the church, you know, things like that. Or, of course, if you're bitten by a vampire, it spreads by contagion. So all of that is a part of ancient history. And so down through the years, Bram Stoker took this character of Vlad Sepesh Dracula and made him into one of the most enduring characters of English fiction. Because really probably, other than maybe Sherlock Holmes, there's hardly anybody that's as well known, maybe except Frankenstein, in world literature from the English language as Dracula. And since that time, we've had a gradual evolution of the vampire. And I won't belabor the point, I said, I said that gradually they become more and more charming, more and more darkly romantic, less and less monstrous. And that started in the 60s with a soap opera named Dark Shadows. Some of you may remember, they had a vampire character in that named Barnabas Collins. And he was a tragic figure because he didn't want to be a vampire. He was the world's first whiny vampire. I mean, he would walk around, I don't want to be a vampire, you know. And he was played by this Canadian actor, Jonathan Fridd, who had Shakespearean training. He did a really good job of it. I, was, I watched the darn thing. Every, in fact... People would cut classes in college to watch, because it was on at 3 o'clock in Central Time. And we'd go and watch it. We'd, heck, forget about the college, you know, we'd go to some dark shadows. That's how bad it was. And it's gotten more and more. And today, like I said, we have, we have these very nice vampires nowadays, but they're still drinking blood. And that's the danger. So, again, the question would be, are they real? To a limited degree, they are. There are people out there that are drinking human blood. They, I mean, all you have to do, as I, I said on the radio show, is Google, like, Vampire Church or Vampire Club or anything like that. Every major city has a place that you can go. You might have to dig a little to find it. Where you can go and you can find someone that you can share each other's blood. You can either be a vampire or a dove. If you're a vampire, you drink the blood. If you're a dove, you get your blood drunk. And it's, it's kind of like where the whole homosexual thing was 25 years ago. It's just coming out, if you will, of the coffin. So, yes, there really are such people. There are, there are vampires that drink blood. They're no, they call themselves sanguinarians. They believe, I actually had people call up a radio, I did a radio show a few weeks ago, and vampires actually called up and were upset with me. Because they said, we're not doing anything wrong, we're just, we're just con indulging in consensual behavior. It's not like we're, we're biting people in the neck without their consent. They want to be bit in the neck. They're called sanguinarians. There's also psychic vampires that feed off of, of life force. You know, they'll drain you of energy. And they're more common than you realize. Have you ever been around a person where they love to get you angry, they love to get you upset, and then afterwards you just feel drained? They're psychic vampires. They might not even know they're psychic vampires, but they're psychic vampires. And nowadays, there's a whole subculture of this. There's, you can watch TV shows on the History Channel where vampires are interviewed. They've been on reality series. You know, they, they, you know it's, it's bizarre. And, you know, they, they talk about how, um, how they drink each other's blood. And some do engage in criminal activity. My friend Jack Chick, who's also my publisher, um, he's out in California, and he's had police since he published Lucifer Dethroned, he's had police talk to him and say that the, every day, practically, 
on the streets of Los Angeles, they find homeless people dead with marks on their neck, drained of blood. They just don't tell anybody. But it's, it's getting epidemic. He said, we don't dare tell the media. But it's, I mean, it's like hundreds of people a year are being killed in L.A. by being exsanguinated, being drained of blood. So, you know, and, and who's going to know? It's homeless people. You know, nobody's going to miss them. Now, the other problem with all this is, is if you indulge in this behavior, you know, I don't want to freak anybody out, but if you indulge in illicit sex, you're going to get demons. Demons are the ultimate STD. In the same way, if you drink blood, you're going to get demons along with the blood. As sure as you know, shoot. So, be aware that there are consequences to sin. Deep, serious consequences. That's not even to mention the health problems. I mean, we all know what's out there now. We got HIV, we got all kinds of bizarre bugs and diseases out there. And now a lot of these vampires will call up and they'll say, oh, well, we always get a certificate from the other person saying they're disease free. You know, whatever. The point is, it's a sin. Just like, you know, homosexuality is a sin. Don't do it. And, you know, the other thing is this. People say, I mean, that pastors tell me, why are you preaching about this? This doesn't even exist. Well, if it doesn't exist, why would Yahuwah forbid it? He says in Genesis 9, 4 to Noah, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Don't drink blood. He told it to Noah. And in case that wasn't enough, Leviticus. He told this in Leviticus to Moses. In Leviticus 17, 10 to 12. Uh, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against the soul that eateth blood, I will cut him off from among his people. Drinking blood was a capital offense in the days of Israel. That's how serious. You know, Deuteronomy 12, 23, Only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. And it was even forbidden by the early church. And some people say, oh, well, preacher, that's just the Old Testament. No. Acts 15. 19 to 21, James, the apostle, speaking, Wherefore, my sentence is, we trouble not them which from the Gentiles are turned to God, but we write unto them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, idols from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. So, you know, Christians should not be drinking blood. They should not be eating blood sausage or blood soup or whatever the heck, you know. Now, why is that? Why would he care? Well, number one, as you may have gathered by now, blood drinking is a common practice in most pagan primitive cultures and some not so primitive pagan cultures, like America. It's getting more and more common. It was common around Israel in the days of the Old Testament. That's partly why he did it. But also, blood drinking is highly addictive. I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, they actually, you know, talk about this. There, there, it's a medical condition. There's, a, there's actually a mental illness. It's called medical vampirism. Think about it. Where people think they have to drink blood, and they'll even bite into their own vein and drink their own blood if they get desperate enough. It's just like being a heroin addict. I would submit to you that in my experience, it's more addictive than drugs. It's more addictive than, than crack, cocaine, or heroin. Because it's got such spiritual bondage with it. Not that drugs don't have a bondage of their own. They do. But the funny thing is, think about it. Nowhere does, does the Bible say, thou shalt not snort crack. Or smoke it, I guess. See, in my day when I did cocaine, you had to snort it, but I guess now you smoke it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm showing my age. Um, nowhere does the Bible say, thou shalt not shoot heroin. But it does say, thou shalt not drink blood. 
And I'm not saying it's okay to do those drugs. I'm just saying that we, we sort of adduce that you shouldn't use mind-altering drugs from the prohibition against getting drunk because it's kind of the same thing. Now, we occasionally get calls by people who are being beset by vampires. Yes, we do. There's nothing special about vampires. They're just another manifestation of the power of Satan. They can be cast out of a home to the power of the cross and the blood of Yeshua. And what I tell anybody, who, and not just vampires, but any kind of spiritual attack, and again, we go into this in greater depth than blood on the doorpost, but you need to pray over your home. Go from room to room and pray and cast the evil spirits out of it. Room by room. And drive them out. The front door, just like kind of like you're fumigating a house, except you're doing it spiritually. And declare the Lordship of Yeshua the Messiah over every room in that house. Then, and this is what most people don't know to do, you need to also cleanse the sin of the shedding of innocent blood over your land. And I don't care if you rent or if you own, or if you and the bank own <laughs> your home. It's still yours by contract. You have the right to pray over that land, even if you just have a little apartment. Pray that the, this is right in Deuteronomy. Pray that the sin of the shedding of innocent blood be remitted over the land. And that or those two things will remove most of the access points that the devil has to get into your home and trouble you. And what's interesting is. And I know this was true because when I was a vampire, I had to follow this rule. A vampire cannot enter a home unless they're invited. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to invite them in. I, I literally had to stand at the door and wait until somebody said, come in. Or I couldn't go into a house. And then if they revoked that invitation, I had to leave immediately. That's why, and this might sound like a weird thing, but I'll just, I'll just throw this out. I don't recommend believers have welcome mats. It's okay if you have like a thing to wipe your feet on. I know you kind of need that in this part of the country. But don't have a welcome mat. Because that is an open invitation to anything evil to come into your home. Did you ever think of that? Think about it. Because we want to be careful who we entertain. Because once you let something like that into your house, it's not easy to get rid of. And, you know, think this only applies, by the way, to private dwellings. A vampire can walk into a bank or can walk into a theater or can walk into public places as much as they want. So, you know, the point is, is that if you think you're being beset by vampires, just pray in the name of Yeshua and rescind the invitation, whoever it might be. Because you don't know, I mean, most real vampires don't look like vampires. I mean, they don't walk around wearing black and goth and black lipstick and eyeshadow and have long stringy hair. No. That isn't what I looked like when I was a vampire. I looked reasonably normal. And most of the vampires I knew and have met over the years look reasonably normal. I mean, they might look a little strange in the eyes if you have spiritual discernment, but they look reasonably normal. Um, and all this relates to the idea that there's a voluntary element in evil. You know, you, you can't be held accountable for sin that you're forced to do. You see what I'm saying? But if you invite evil in, then watch out. If you entertain evil, then watch out. Okay, I'm going to talk real briefly about the whole werewolf thing because I know some of you, your head started spinning when I mentioned werewolves. But believe it or not, there are werewolves out there. And friends of mine have seen them. I've talked to them myself. I haven't seen a full-blown werewolf myself, but my wife has. They're very scary and they're very real and they're very much the devil. Um, again, this is something that's been around forever.
in cultural history. Here in America, the Native Americans, some of the tribes, have what are called skinwalkers. They're people that can turn into animals, just like that. And I'll tell you a true story, because people say, how can that be, Pastor? How can that be? Well, it's interesting. I know a guy who was a Christian uh, pe um, pediatrician, and he, he lives up in the Pacific Northwest. And he told me this story himself, and I have no reason to doubt it. He would go and do pro bono work on the Indian Reservation and witness Christ to the native people. And many of them were getting saved. And every evening when he'd leave, he'd drive out the gate of the reservation. There's this weird little old Indian lady standing there. She was wrapped up in a blanket, and she just glowered at him. You know, like, if looks could kill, his car would have probably blown up. <clears throat> And he thought, okay, whatever, you know. Well, after about four or five times, he'd go there every couple of weeks or so. He was driving out. It was still daylight. You know, the sun was still up. And she was standing there glowering at him. And literally, like that, she was gone. And there was this big raven standing on the ground. Just in the blink of an eye. And then the raven was glowering at him with those same black, beady eyes. And the raven looked at him as he kept driving out of the gate, and then the raven flew off. And he said, was that a skinwalker? And I says, yeah. Yeah, she was probably a medicine woman who hated the fact that he was bringing the gospel to these young Native American children and stealing them away from the ancient, you know, religion. So, you know, again, this is all over the world. We see this. And, you know, I'll just tell you a couple of things that are from my lifetime, from my experience. I was down speaking in Salt Lake City at a conference for Ed Decker. And my wife was um, back up in the woods in Issaquah, Washington, and beset by a werewolf. All of a sudden there was this thing walking around the house. Thump, thump, thump. You know, like some very, very large animal. And she and her sister looked out the window. And they were on the second floor, and this thing was looking in the window with dark red eyes glaring in the light of the lamp in our window. And they thought, I don't know what this is, but, you know, we're going to pray. And they started pleading the blood. And this thing was pacing around outside. It was eight feet tall, at least. And it couldn't get in because of the blood of the Lamb. That's how powerful prayer can be if you know how to intercede, if you know how to pray. And in any event, the other one that happened out, see, there's a lot of weirdness in the Pacific Northwest, let me tell you. I don't know if any of you have ever been out there, but <clears throat> there's stuff out there that, would kind of make, and oddly enough, also northern Wisconsin is another place where there's a lot of weird stuff. And um, we had a lady bring her son to us for ministry, and he'd had a horrifying experience. He and his friend were out after dark bicycling around, which was not a good idea in Seattle. And they were driving, they were biking around a uh, landfill, an even worse idea. And, you know, smelly, horrible place, methane fires burning, you know, stuff like that. And they were biking around, and they turned around this big, huge pile of trash, and they stopped because they saw this ritual happening about 50 yards away. It was a circle of people in black robes, and they were going to kill this woman. And they could tell that's what it was. The knife was going down and everything, and the kids freaked and turned around and tried to be quiet and pedaled the other way as fast as their little little banana bikes can carry them. Well, believe it or not, they heard these footsteps behind them, you know, boom, 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 you know, and they looked behind and there was this thing chasing them on two legs, which was at least two stories high. It was black, that's all they could see, because of course this was in the middle of the night. And they're pedaling for all it's worth. 
you know, and the, the front kid is pedaling and pedaling and pedaling, and all of a sudden he hears his friend shriek. And he looks behind him, and it, no friend, no bike, no nothing. And he keeps pedaling, and, you know, he was, like, terrified. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 here's this footprints again. This thing is gaining on him. And it happened, this little boy was a Christian. And he could feel this thing's breath on his back. And he didn't even dare look around, because he knew if he did, he'd probably be so terrified he'd freeze. And he, this huge hand that was like twice the size of my hand came around and grabbed him like this. And he cried out, oh, Jesus! And it just let go like it was scalded. And he got away. He needed 30 stitches on his chest from that claw. But he escaped with his life. They never found the other boy. And, of course, the place was completely clean when the cops went up there because these folks are really good about covering their tracks. So, yeah, we've had many people tell us since Lucifer Throne came out about having sightings of werewolves. And I, I don't have time to go into it. Oh, i got to tell you one more because this will just illustrate how evil can sometimes hide in very strange places. How about a were-ape? Ever hear of a were-ape? Well, you ever hear of YWAM, Youth with a Mission? Yes. Well, it's a, it's a youth missionary organization. And my friend Ed Decker and I both were involved with them back in the 80s. And um, at one time, Ed was with a YWAM coordinator down in Tonga, because the Mormons were really trying to get into the Polynesian Islands. Because I don't know if you know this, but Mormons are huge in Hawaii. They own a lot of Hawaii outright. And anyway, um, they were walking through this village preaching the dangers of Mormonism. Ed and Tom, his friend from YWAM. And this Mormon bishop, he was a native guy, you know, he was a Tongan. Big, you know, if you've ever met a Tongan, they tend to be very big people. Big guy came up to them, and he starts reviling, you know, cursing them in the name of the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the Mormon priesthood, and saying, how dare you preach against the gospel of Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ, and just railing on them, you know. And all of a sudden, this is in broad daylight in front of two Christian men. This guy started tearing out of his clothes. His faith started cracking and elongating, and he turned into an ape, just barking like a giant orangutan, right before their very eyes. He looked like a human orangutan. And Ed looks at, you know, his friend Tom, and he says, can you believe this? And they go, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Shut up. <laughs> and the guy, little, little, like this, he turned back into a human, except he'd torn out of all of his temple garments and all of his clothes, he was like almost naked, kind of like the Hulk, you know, always ends up nearly naked after one of his things. And he just ran off like the devil was after him. But that was a Mormon who was a were-ape. And we encountered a woman whose husband was a Mormon bishop and an airline pilot and a werewolf. And we saw the scars to prove it. She needed ministry because she wanted out of that marriage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wake up one morning and find out your nice Mormon bishop is actually a werewolf? Yeah. So, anyway. And people, I, I always talk about the werewolf that's in the Bible. And I'm only half funny with you. But read this passage. I don't have time to get into it. But Daniel 4.14 4, through 16. It's about the curse that was placed on the book of Nezer. And it talks about how he was given, also Daniel 4.33, the heart of a beast. And his fingernails grew out like claws. And his hair grew out on his back like bird's feathers. Sounds kind of creepy to me. So, you know, the point is, this stuff is real. Even though Hollywood tries to make it seem as if it's a fantasy. And... We're supposed to be apart from the world. We're not supposed to be entertaining the things of the world. Amen. 
And, you know, because we're going to be held accountable for every idle word that we speak. And I think that includes the idle words that we allow to come into our heads. Because there's so much filth out there spiritually nowadays.